All right, we're live. Thank you everyone for joining. Super excited today to talk to you about uh, how to mix STEM and engineering with movement and PE and get your students moving, uh, moving around and having fun with STEM and PE. And uh, I'm joined today by a very special guest. I'll let him introduce himself. Good morning, everybody, or evening or afternoon when you're watching this recording, we're not quite sure. Uh, my name is Eric Turrell. I teach at Round Hill Elementary School in Round Hill, Virginia. I'm a physical education teacher for, of uh, 25 years teaching elementary students. And right now I have the privilege of teaching online kindergarten PE, and it is a trip. And I'm sure all of you all experience the same issues that we're having. But today we wanna to talk to you about how to integrate movement into your STEM um, and how to get the kids up and moving and having fun and loving those wonderful STEM projects. Awesome, yes, and my name's Lauren. I'm from the Unruly Splats team. We're based in Boston, but uh, we've been working with Eric for a number of years and uh, we love what he's doing. So we're excited to, uh, to hear him talk about it. It's always a treat. So before we get started, I want to do a little recap about your school, Eric. Tell us a little bit about Round Hill. All right, so Round Hill, Loudoun County is up near uh, Leesburg, DC. We're about an hour and a half from Washington, DC. Uh, we're up in Leesburg, Ashburn. And Round Hill Elementary School is a medium-sized school. We have about 500 and 590 students. Um, for PE, they get PE three days a week for 30 minutes. But right now with the COVID being virtual, it's once every two weeks for 45 minutes. Uh, the nice thing about our school is that we are a code to the future school, and this is our, I'm thinking right now, I think this is our fifth year or fourth year of being a coding school. And what that means is <clears throat> every student in our school from kindergarten through fifth grade for 30 minutes a day work on some sort of coding project. Uh, we work with robots, work with Scratch, work with... Um, different software, uh, we work with unruly splats, and the students will learn how to code uh, on an elementary scale. Even our kindergartners are doing it. So it's, it's very exciting to see how from year one to year two to year three, as they go from kindergarten to first to second, how they're progressing uh, with the use of technology within their educational setting. It's very exciting. Yeah, and that's amazing uh, what the kindergarten students uh, can can do uh, at their young age. We've seen them coding their own games. So uh, it really is exciting to see that progression like Eric mentioned, we love seeing that. All right, so I wanted to kind of start out with, I always like to start out with the why, you know, there are, most of the people watching this uh, recording, I think will be, you know, STEM and engineering teachers. Uh, and so this might be a new concept combining STEM and PE. So why, why should they do it, Eric? Well, my master's degree is in kinesi kinesiology, the study of movement. And there's a lot of science behind movement. And so my passion falls within, of course, getting the kids moving. Um, but then it's, it's getting their hands, uh, tactile learners, getting their hands on and manipulating and moving things around. And, and as a student, I had a hard time sitting in classes and sitting and sitting and sitting. I was that student that needed to move. And then when I became a PE teacher and I learned about integration and STEM, oh, mixing the science with the movement and getting kids to move and then they're excited to, to be able to manipulate and move things around, it's, it's rewarding and uh, love it. Um, been doing it for 24 years. Um, this is my 25th year. It's kind of hard to do it online right now, hoping to get the kids back to hybrid as soon as we can. Um, it's just, it's fun. It's fun. It's fun to learn. It's fun to experiment. It's fun to try new things and to get up and move and run and science and all that. It's very exciting. I know I'm repeating myself. <laughs> No, it's it's true, and and there's a ton of research on um, on the benefits of combining exercise and like sort of the cognitive side of retention and, and understanding and that deeper learning. And the example that from my life that just jumps into my mind, I went to a fine arts school, which meant that um, sort of 
like the coding school, every, every, every class had incorporated some sort of artistic thing. And so, you know, so in, in our science class, instead of learning about the heart by a textbook, we had uh, people around the room, like actually building the heart. And then there were people with uh, hula hoops that were blue that were like traveling throughout the heart to see how the blood flowed. And so it's all, you know, it's a bit out there, but, but it really committed it to memory. And I still remember it to this day. And that was, you know, when I was in grade three. So it just goes to show how big an impact it can have. Oh, that's exciting. That sounds fun. Yeah, we do was. something similar to that with the, uh, the, the whole body, the, the way um, blood and oxygen flows through the body. We create this uh, thing throughout the gym and uh, you just body mapping, you know, putting everything that happens in the body you know, into uh, a station, you know, simulation. And uh, that's, that's a lot of fun. The students do enjoy it. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that's also part of it, making students, making sure students are having fun uh, and enjoying what they do, because then they'll want to learn more. All right. So then we get to the how. If we know that it's important, everyone's on board, how do we combine STEM uh, and movement? You've got some tips. Start small. That's the most important thing, start small. Um, right now with hybrid, it's just about perfect, you know, because I don't, I don't know about um, our listeners' classrooms, but in Loudoun right now with our hybrid classes, they're only seeing between seven and 10 kids at a time. So if, if your concern is a reason why you haven't integrated STEM with movement in the past is just because the amount of students you have in your space now is kind of the ideal time to do it when you only have seven or 10 kids. Um, you can have some kids working on one project, another, another group of kids working on something else, cut out a small section of your classroom to work on the movement part. Um, it's gonna be a little noisy, you know, it's movement, uh, but you will see the results on how excited they become and, and their level of retention as Lauren, you discussed earlier, it does help with the memory of what you're experiencing and taking it from the short-term to the long-term memory because you've been able to manipulate and move things around. Um, let them get their hands messy. Let them get their hands dirty. It washes off. It's gonna be okay. Um, just be positive, have fun. And before you know it, you're gonna feel more comfortable and be able to dive into uh, something a little bit bigger um, or not, stay on the small scale. It's what works for you. Awesome. And you have some examples too that you um, wanted to share. So I'm gonna go through a couple of those and, and uh, kind of explain what they are. All right, so um, I think the first couple ones we're showing here are <laughs> when- Just Virtual, I think, right? Yeah, these are all virtual. <laughs> so when when teaching kind of shut down last March, um, daggone it, and we were forced to teach from home, my teaching partner and I uh, started a TV show, um, PE with Mr. T and Mr. Lopes, and we would put on a weekly TV show. And in that show, there would be minute to win it activities where we would compete through Zoom um, or Google Meets against each other from my house to his house. And then we would do timers and, and there would always be three different minute to win it's um, for us to compete against its students and students compete against us. And we would communicate through Facebook and, um, oh, what was the, uh, we had a chat thing we did with them. Can't even think of the name right now. I remember the March Madness you had back at last March. Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. They it. Yeah, and if you, you kind of pick who's going to win based on the exercises you do and work yourself through it. But we would, this one right here, this uh, card pyramid edition was a game we made up and Mr. Lose and I competed against each other and we we're able to get our assistant principal to join us on the, the Google Meet session on this one. And she did it from outside in her yard. But the way it's done is you're 10 feet away and you take a rolled up Socks is what we did. We did a lot of stuff with rolled up socks turned into balls because you don't know what equipment everyone has. And it's a race for one minute. You toss out your sock. If it lands on it, you add up your points. You toss your other item, add it up. Um, 
face value cards are worth the point. Um, but then if you get a 10 Jack, Queen, King, those are all 10 points. Ace is worth 15. You can adjust the point values for younger ages if you need to. But there's a QR code here. If you were to click on it uh, with your phone or device, it'll take you right to the YouTube version of us playing against each other and against our system principal. All these Metatowinets, we had so much fun. And then the feedback that we received through Facebook and through, I wish I could remember the name of that, uh, that app we used to, to chat with the kids. Um, but uh, maybe I'll remember that as the class goes on here, a session goes on. But uh, So they had to throw the sock to hit the, the cards and then depending on which one they hit, they got a certain number of points. Yeah, and then they would, after they threw all three, they'd run down, grab them, come back, throw them again, run down, grab them, come back. It's how many points can you accumulate in one minute? Oh my goodness. And then we would uh, laugh and giggle and then we would challenge each other again, play again, talk about, you know, all right, what worked for you? Underhand toss, overhand toss, what signs at a bounce and kind of roll a little bit? What did you learn? What, what did, corrections did you make? Uh, you know, this one was a, uh, in STEM, M for mathematics. Uh, this was a, a mathematics activity we did. And then I think on the next slide, shows, yeah, this was the QR, this is the video of what we did. And that's the guy I teach with Mr. Lowe's, that's his backyard. So he did this one also outside. Awesome. And I don't think we have the uh, ability to show the video right now, but if you uh, put the QR code up with your phone and take a photo of it, that should lead to the YouTube channel where you can watch all the videos here. Yeah. Yeah, we have a pretty good YouTube channel. That's helped us with this whole virtual learning right now. And also to help us connect with other PE teachers and other classroom teachers. Our YouTube channel, you'll see my logo out there. It's R-H-E-P-E or Round Hill PE. There's also a playlist for classroom teachers um, of activities they can do in, in their classroom, like brain breaks, instant, instant activities. There's an entire playlist just for classroom teachers. And there's a STEM in the gym playlist in there also. Uh, we're gonna talk about that later on. I know, hit on that. This one was the paper airplane cornhole. This was a trip, man. So we had, I think this one was just me and Mr. Lowe's and maybe his son, Blake, a little eight-year-old competed with us on this one. So we, what we did is we, uh, first we experimented different ways of making airplanes. So you're getting into the engineering phase here with how to make different type of airplanes. And at the end of this video, I do a overhead camera shot of me making five different, I, I take you through how to make five different styles of paper airplanes with it. That was fun to record. <laughs> but um, I found for this little activity, the paper airplane that I'm using there, what this is, it's kind of like regular cornhole. Uh, you're behind the line, you throw the paper airplane, if it hits the basket, it's worth one point. If it goes in the basket, it's worth three points. And, to, and you have to learn how to throw that paper airplane, trial and error. Sometimes it veers here, veers there, dives down. You gotta learn you know, the proper mechanics of what that paper airplane does. And it's just, just so much fun to move. And we're engineering, we're building paper airplanes, we're studying the flight of it. Uh, addition we're doing the math and we're just having fun yeah so that's another one click that qr code and you get to see the video of us playing against each other and then our students challenge against us awesome and like you were saying it's hands-on you know the students are, are are seeing what works and what doesn't in real time which i think is the uh is the really important thing here and there are no losers when we do this it's strictly for fun. I mean, we, we laugh, we laugh. We have so much fun recording those. You know, what ends up being like a nine minute session usually takes us about 45, 50 minutes because we're just laughing, cracking up, busting on each other. <laughs> so this is kind of the overhead view. I guess there's four different paper airplanes uh, that starts the tutorial at the end of that video, how to make, these are the different airplanes we walked our students through on how to make them. That was fun. Kids yeah. are back in school. All the other teachers will be coming to you to say, hey, all my kids are making paper airplanes. <laughs> 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 oh, 
I'll say, oh, but. <laughs> or they're taking their shoes off, taking their socks off and rolling them up and doing things with their socks. That's what we do also. <laughs> exactly. Looking forward to the day where we can see, see the students in person. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Sooner the better. All right, so this was, oh, this was, okay, so this one's just me. This was a STEM in the gym science experiment with balloon distance challenge. So we, you could see on my couch there in my hand, there are three different sizes of balloons. So the students are experimenting force with large, medium, small objects, and then also force of hard force, medium force, or soft force. And they're going to tape measure uh, that little orange tape measure on the couch there. Um, and then there's Lauren, go to the next slide if you wouldn't mind. I think that's uh, the chart. Yeah. So this is what the chart looks like. So they start at one line and they start with a large balloon and they hit it as hard as they can, hard force, and they measure to see how far it goes before it lands. And then they do the same balloon with medium force and then soft force to see how far it travels. And then they do the medium balloon hard, medium, soft, and the small size balloon, hard, medium, soft, measuring the distance. And then it's a science experiment, which one traveled further? And then kind of think about, okay, why, why did the medium with medium force travel farther than the large balloon with hard force? You know, what, what could have played with the air wrapping around the balloon as it traveled through, or the force collapsed the balloon so much that it wasn't able to progress through, or then you get into a small little discussion as, okay, let's analyze this. What happened? What was going on during this? And it's just fun. It's fun. Science. I love science. Science is fun. You're muted. Thank you. So they're writing down the distance in these, uh, in these squares. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That is so much fun. I love that. And then the discussion part's fun too, because then the students start to brainstorm, you know, like you said, the reasons for that, so. And we're sharing our thoughts. You know, there's, we're communicating and we're, there isn't a wrong answer. You know, your thought counts, your thought matters. And then we just kind of discuss, you know, okay, what's going on here? It's good to, good to think outside the box. Yeah, I like that. All right, so you have some, these, are, these were all unplugged activities too. Um, is that right? And so uh, we have some more unplugged activities here that you've done that are not necessarily virtual, but would work in sort of a more hybrid or in-person setting uh, when, when we're allowed to. And, and I liked how on the picture you put uh, pre-COVID on some of them. <laughs> yes. Just in case anybody had any concerns. They're, like, they're not wearing masks. They're not six feet apart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Trigger warning if yeah. <laughs> for people who, um, but yeah, exactly. This, these are, these are pre-COVID. So, uh, but still very good examples of how Eric was incorporating STEM into his PE classes um, before, before this all happened. So, uh, and they're really fun activities. So I'm excited for him to walk through them, but. Uh, all right. So this first one, you're with a partner and you can see on the Frisbees, on the back of the Frisbees, I drew arrows. So scratch, um, scratch coding, scratch is a software that our students learn to code with a lot. And your sprite is your little character that moves through whatever you create um, on your scratch board. So on the floor, I created an obstacle course. We threw down rubber animals, hula hoops, broken hula hoops, real hula hoops, and just created this mess on the floor. You have to navigate your sprite taking one step at a time to navigate through the, through the maze, through the playing area. You can't talk, you just have to use the coding of, you know, one step forward, one step left, one step right, one step back you know, to, to help move through. So it's a one of those non-verbal, similar to uh, Scratch, you know, you have to just plug in the data. You have to tell it what you want it to, to happen. And if a student bumps into an object, I believe they just had to do like five jumping jacks, take five steps back and then start again. Um, and then once they make it all the way through, they trade places, uh, give the Frisbee, go back. And we encourage them to move to a different spot on the other side so you're not constantly doing the same maze, go somewhere else. And uh, yeah, just nonverbal communication, trusting each other, having fun, moving through, 
one step at a time. Yeah, that's a fun little activity there. So it's sort of like an obstacle course that they are guiding each other through. And how does this connect to Scratch? So in Scratch with coding, your sprite to move through, you have to be able to tell your sprite um, very specific. You know, you have to tell it how far to travel forward, how far to travel left, how far to travel right. And so this is helping the students realize, you know, why, what that actually is. You're putting it in their hands um, as they get to feel, you know, what, what it's like to be that sprite moving through and understand that you got to tell it exactly what you want it to do. And in, in, in engineering and in coding, you're going to mess up. It's not going to work perfect. So it's, and that's the same in life. You're allowed to mess up. You know, you find out what went right, what went wrong, and you make adjustments and you move on. Um, but that's the beauty of STEM. Learn from your mistakes. You're allowed to make mistakes. It's fun to make mistakes sometimes. <laughs> you can learn from them. And I think the next one was another coding. All right, so uh, we have these uh, Sphero balls and our students in the classroom make little mazes with them. Well, this was a life-size version of that. It's the same coding with the Frisbee turning through, but I've got a ton of cut up noodles as you can kind of see there. And so this was a station over on the sides. We had other activities going. And when they got to this, it was a combination of two groups, I think, that came together. And they got to create their maze, however they wanted with the noodles. And then they would move with a partner in the Frisbee. They would move their partner through the maze, telling them one step forward, another step forward, another step forward, step left, step left to get through the maze. And once you got through, trade spots with your partner, go back. And then when it's time to rotate, you move all of your noodles back. So the next group's coming in, get to share the noodles and make their own, their mazes. I, I like that so much because our one uh, complaint about the robots is that, you know, the students are getting to code the robots to go through a maze, but like they're not moving, the, you know, the robot is moving. And so I love that you've switched it. And now it's about the students and they're moving through the maze. Um, I think that's great. And all of these, you can find all of these if you go to our, my Twitter or if you just type in hashtag STEM in the gym. And you've probably seen it logo pop up on the screen a couple of times. If you type in STEM in the gym, it's a hashtag that I kind of created a couple of years back. Uh, it's from the STEM in the gym is a, a book and uh, I bought the book and read it. And it's all about simple machines. But then I kind of ran with the hashtag hashtag. STEM in the gym, and you'll see a lot of a lot of stuff that we do. But then teachers from around the country that have tapped into it, and they're posting their stuff, and it's really grown into a great network of sharing with other teachers and what they're doing with STEM in the gym. It's a lot, a lot of fun. This is a the old school game of Battleship, where you have the the plastic board. I got one. Lauren has one, and I put my boats in a certain my battleships in a certain spot. She can't see it. But it's an Excel spreadsheet is what it ends up being. You know, you have, you have columns, you have rows, and then how do you navigate? And you say, B6, you missed, or B12, you sunk my battleship. Well, this is that version, but life-size. So on each side, put up the volleyball net, draped over the uh, parachutes. It takes two parachutes to do it. And you cannot see on the other side. You're blind to the other side. Now on the other side, they take a combination of a hula hoop with a bowling pin and that creates a battleship. So on each side, it varies on numbers between 15 to 10 battleships, depending on class size and space size and if we have double class. And in this game, you take a ball and you throw it over top the parachute net and you try to hit a battleship on the other side. Um, first time you're gonna miss because you don't know where they're at. But as it's being thrown over, if the other team's able to catch your ball, then they get a prize. They get to a peaky, a sneaky peek lap. They get to run one lap around the perimeter of the other side. And while they're doing that, they are going through an Excel spreadsheet in their mind. They're mapping out in their mind based on the tile squares that are on our floor. 
and the markings on our gym floor, the basketball uh, key, the black line that goes around. Um, we have tape lines that are identical to the other side as a reference point. And then like in the diagram down there in the bottom right, uh, the students as they're doing that one lap around the other side, they'll count from two blocks up, three blocks over, and it tells them exactly where the bowling pin is. Then when they get to their side, using the same reference points, they will move two blocks up, three blocks over, and they're standing in the exact same spot that the, the battleship is on the other side. Then when a ball comes over and they get it, they know exactly where that pin is. And if they knock it over the other team, if the other team hollers out, you sank my battleship, then yeah, you feel good about it. But mm -hmm. then for the players that yell out, you sank my battleship, that's what we want. That's good behavior. So they get to run one lap around. If they clean up the hula hoop, they get to run a lap. If they clean up a, ba a bowling pin, they get to run a lap. Oh, shoot, they're running. Who cares? That's what we want. They're having fun. They're mm -hmm. uh, coding. They're looking on the other side. They're running these laps. They get back to the other side. They pick up a ball. They map it out. And they try to toss it over and hit the other side. Now, in the very back, we have a disc golf catcher. I love disc golf. I love getting out, going for hikes with my dog, let him run and play disc golf. The disc golf catcher in the back is a bonus. If you put it in there, you'll hear the chains. And then we make a big deal about it. And you get to rebuild a battleship and bring it back in. That oh, is a fun, fun, fun game. A... The uh, first week of, there's a week in September. It's, um, it's, an, it's for physical education. It's a national thing. It's called Bring Your Parent to PE Week. Bring Your Parent to PE Week. And we will play this game the entire week that we have parents coming in because it's, it's easy, doesn't take much explaining. Parents can play it too without being overly competitive. And we have fun, the parents love it, um, great PR. And uh, we, we show them how we're able to get the STEM, uh, the science, the, uh, the math involved in with it as we're playing it. It's, it's a lot of fun. Just using the vocabulary on STEM and science and technology and math and just use the vocabulary. Yeah. It's a great uh, family engagement. Yes, yeah. Awesome. All right, so in the very, very beginning, so the um, simple machines is what I got started with, with STEM. You know, in the beginning it was all, I did a lot of uh, classroom integration, but then I got into that book, STEM in the Gym is all about simple machines. And so we created stations throughout the gym that worked on pulleys and levers and fulcrums and force and um, wedges, and they would do little tiny science experiments at each one of these STEM stations. Um, camp Stimovation, that's what it was called. That was a summer camp where we um, put these in. That's the Twitter post to it, yeah. And uh, they, would, they would do, do the simple machines. Um, I see pulleys down at the bottom. That was a science project where you either did it on a carpet square or a scooter. So you're talking about the friction, uh, force, friction, distance, how much, how hard is it to pull, uh, wheel and axle, utilizing wheels and axles. Gosh, man, good memories. Those are fun. <laughs> and what's happening in the top left hand corner? I have to ask. Yeah, that one was chaos, is what's <laughs> happening there. <laughs> so. That is a uh, wedge and how to get a student, how to get an object up on a platform to go into a, um, into a warehouse or something, just how to get an object up on a platform. And that you could either lift that object up onto the platform or you can utilize the, the wedge with the, the ground and how the slope, and you can just kind of roll it up. Uh, like Great that. in theory, <laughs> it was chaos and practical use. Uh, the kids loved it. You can see those kids right there cracking up as they're oh, doing yeah. it. Um, we had fun. Uh, got across a little bit of the message, um, but yeah, we had fun with that one. <laughs> Looks like fun. All right, and this is, I think, our last unplugged activity. 
uh, mass versus distance experiment. Tell us about All right, that. so with this one was on the uh, walls of my gym, every five feet, I would put a piece of duct tape, five foot, 10 foot, 15. I think we got all the way up to 35 feet. And then we moved a, a small group was, each group was 10 to 15 feet away from the wall. Marked it on the floor. And then it was a science experiment to see how far they could throw each one of these objects um, up the wall. And then they would measure, count the blocks on the wall, how far up it went. And then they would, similar to that balloon activity we did in the beginning. Now understand when I say bowling ball, it's not a real bowling ball. They did, were not throwing bowling balls. This bowling ball is, it's, it's hollow, it's rubber, it's an elementary version of a bowling ball. Um, it's not a marble, you know, real bowling ball that they're throwing against the wall. Um, people keep pointing that one out. You got kids throwing bowling balls? <laughs> it's an elementary version of a bowling ball. But they, uh, they throw it and then they circle, you know, they, they were three tries and they record their distances and they circle the one that went the farthest uh, up the wall. And then at the end, then they figure out, okay, which item were they able to throw the farthest um, up the wall? And then we have a conversation about it. Okay, why, why does your group think that item was able to travel the farthest? And these numbers on that are, that are circled here, those are the uh, the numbers in feet of how, how far it traveled? Uh, blocks, they count the blocks on the wall. So that's eight, um, the blue, let's do the example, the blue ball, Mr. T, first attempt, it went six blocks up. Second attempt, it went eight blocks up. Third attempt, only went five blocks. So they circle the one that was the, the greatest of the three. And then after they've done all the different balls, then they circle of all of them, which one traveled the best, which and the, for me, it was the hacky sack in the second attempt. Yeah, that's a lot, 25 squares, that's awesome, cool. Yeah. Okay, and now we're gonna kind of talk about how in general you're using technology to, to help during COVID. Um, as we're all sort of, these are all great ideas and it sounds like you've done some trial and error and experimented with what's worked and what hasn't. So um, tell us a little bit about how you're using technology during COVID to help you. During COVID. Um, okay, so during COVID, because it's all virtual. So we do a lot of, um, Everything I put here on the screen is uh, what we did before COVID. So back when we're back in, in regular real world, uh, we utilize technology in our physical education program a lot because we only have them for 30 minutes and we wanna maximize their time, maximize the experience for them and not waste anything. So when they first come in, uh, we have a projector up on a screen, a little short throw that throws the image up on the screen with the warm up of what we're doing to instantly get going. We use the app uh, V Clone and Spinny Wheel and Swerk It V Clone. What's nice about that is it can turn one of me into up to eight of me mm -hmm. doing different warm ups and activities. I usually keep it to four. It's easier to record that way. And uh, if you go to my YouTube site. Uh, R-H-E-P-E -E, and type in V-Clone, there will be a lot of examples of how we utilize that in a classroom. Um, it's maximizing the visual experience with me so that way then the students better understand what they're supposed to be doing on task time. Uh, we can put in differentiation activities into on the iPads around so they could see the stations and how things are going. Uh, we can do uh, self-assessment with the video delay app where I can record them. They record themselves, they watch their, their performance, and then they can analyze their performance. And they can even give themselves a grade using clickers um, on a board we have off to the side. And then unruly splats. My students love having the unruly splats as stations mixed throughout the gym. Uh, we bring them in, we compete against the whole school by writing your score up on a board. Um, on how you progress. And then we can also compete against students from other schools. We have some nice Twitter competitions against other schools. But your question was during COVID, how do we use technology? I got off topic there. So during COVID, 
Uh, during COVID, <laughs> we do a lot with uh, Google Slides. We have Google Slides off to the side and within Google Slides, we will use the, the Spinny Wheel app on my iPad or my phone. Uh, I'll create a, uh, a separate student logging in. Um, so there'll be a Mr. T in there and then there'll be Mr. T for the presentation and then there'll be a Mr. T's phone off to the side and I can pull up the spinny wheel on it on the screen and I can spin it and it will say, you know, give students choices on what activity we're going to do, what movement we're going to do. Um, we do kind of like Jeopardy or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but and the whole teaching online thing for PE and specials, you know, it's that's been that's been fun, but it's been challenging. And we're not able to get in as depth as what we would really, really enjoy doing. So we're hoping that we can get back to hybrid here very soon. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. Making the making the best of a not ideal situation. And just like with the other stuff, trial and error. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to find things that do work, don't work. You know, keep working on it. And that's what we're trying. Awesome. So um, what do you have here? These are, so this is, you, you've mentioned splats. So I wanted to give um, folks a chance to see some examples of what oh, yeah. we have unruly splats here. But before, before they kind of see, because sometimes it's hard to understand, you know, what the heck are these things? Um, so I wanted to give a quick explanation about what splats are. So you can see there's the physical component of the splats on the ground. These are like floor buttons. You can stomp on them. You can jump on them. They're meant to be, uh, they're meant to, you know, take some durability and, and take some, some beatings. And so uh, they are programmable. So the students are the ones who are coding them. They can light up, they make sounds, and they sense when they're stomped on so that students can code the rules to create their own games with these floor button splats and then they get to play them together. And so there's the coding component, which is through our, uh, our app, uh, which you can see in the background there, very, very similar to Scratch. Um, so it's using the same types of block based coding language. Uh, and then it gives the students a chance to see in real time how the code that they are putting on the iPad or the Chromebook is affecting the splat and they can um, have fun and play games. And so we also have the virtual component since COVID. Uh, we've come up with a number of activities that are virtual only, but uh, a lot of Eric's examples here were uh, pre-COVID. <laughs> and so I, I have the pre-COVID uh, label on them, <laughs> <laughs> but let's go through a few of them. We're running, running low on time, but there's uh, lots of good stuff to get through. Okay. All right. So, um... We use this whack-a-mole activity that's uh, pre-built in the app that yep. Lauren was talking about. And it's whack-a-mole. The students, and this was a great little introduction because they, all they had to do is <laughs> coded for them automatically. All they had to do is click the run button and it starts. And of the four um, unruly splats down there, one of them lights up. You step on that one, whack it, step on it. And then another one will light up. If you get it correctly, you get a point. If you're just delayed just enough, it takes away a point. And it also elicits a sound. If you do it correctly, it dings. If you do it incorrectly, it um, mm -hmm. and And this is kind of the introduction to the students of what unruly splats are. Uh, we start with this as a simple little station that kids can rotate through. You could see we have the orange sheet on the, on the wall. We love to record our data just for fun. If you're able to meet uh, like I like 10 that. Or more, and I like that you also more, record or more. the, or you have code in the background. Say what? Lauren, what'd you say? I'm sorry. I said, I also like how you have the code displayed in the background. Yeah. And they can see it and kind of learn from it as to what's, what's going on here. Now, go ahead and go to the next one. This is where we start to, now we're starting to work into how the code is working. But this is, these are pre-programmed um, projects or, that are already in it. What was this one called, Lauren? Um, the code that's built in on this one. This one, it's called Race in Place. Race in Place. So with this, it's uh, 
it's a time thing. Student hits run and you have 30 seconds to see how many points you can get. And you're just, you can, these are all different fitness activities, but it's the same code. So the student in the top left is just step, step, step as fast as he can for 30 seconds. Every time he gets a splat, he gets a point and it's just tallying up his points. The student on the right is doing a crab walk, same march in place, seeing how many he can get. And like Lawrence said, these things are durable. These, you could see how much we're pop, 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 popping on them, never a problem. They, they held up very good. And then the girl's doing uh, plank walks on, off, on, off. And she's seeing how many points she can do. And it's the same code. All the student has to do, the partner clicks run, it starts. And when the 30 seconds is up, there's a honk and then they both go red, I think. And it stops and then they trade spots. And this is where the creativity piece comes in. Cause like Eric said, this is the same code but they're doing different exercises. And so I think what we've seen is, you know, we, we work with a lot of, uh, you know tech teachers, engineering teachers, math teachers but the PE teachers are, you know not afraid to change the rules for the same code. And I, and I love that <laughs> because it makes it so much more fun when the students get to, you know you give them the structure of, okay this is the code and this is what happens when this happens but there's a whole other you know, realm of opportunity of what happens in between. So I love that um, that it, it, that you're utilizing the same code for different exercises to see, and uh, you know, it's easy to see the improvement because each time they touch it, it will add up that point. And so uh, it's also, um, you know, a stopwatch and a countdown time where those things are all built into the app. And then uh, this was a relay race and now's the first time they actually see how we're gonna modify the code just a little bit based on the relay race. So the group has their iPad and in it, it says, uh, it clicks, you click the run button, stopwatch starts. Every time you hit that, um, you have to hit that splat first and then this splat second and then that splat third and then this splat fourth. But depending on how many people are in your group is what you will tell it on how many laps you're gonna make, how many trips you're gonna make. If you have two people in your group, then you're gonna do, uh, tell the code that after four, stop, stop, watch, stop. If you had three people in your group, you would tell it after six. That way person go down, back, next person, down, back, next person, down, back. So this is the first time we're letting the students modify the code based on the, the Pre, the pre-coding that uh, Splat's already pr provided for us, but now the students are able to manipulate the code to get the results that they need. Yeah. Uh, here we gave each group uh, a hula hoop full of equipment and gave them four different relay race challenges. And then they write their score up on the uh, board underneath each one of the different challenges. Uh, just a, a fun way to move and experiment and to get a little bit more in depth with the coding on the unruly splat. Yeah. And if and you uh, hit that right. QR code, you'll go right to the, I think this is an unruly splat um, video that we created. It has like 10 different ways to use unruly splats in our gym or something like that. Yeah, so check out that QR code there on the side. Awesome. And I think the that. next one, we get into even more coding. All right, so here is uh, agility run. What was it? What's the code called? It's something agility. I, agility the, splat. What? Agility splats, yeah. So in the top one, they're program, they programmed it to do just two splats. And they start in the middle. There's a little X in the middle. And the person holding the iPad says, ready, set, start, or ready, set, go. They click the run button. And it's a timer again. And it's a, the code is for a splat to randomly light up. The student doesn't know which one's gonna light up. He has X amount of time to get to the splat and touch it before to get the point. If he makes it there in that three seconds or whatever, then it'll give a ding and give him a point. If he doesn't make it there in the three seconds and he still touches it, then it takes away a point or it goes uh, something like that. But the, yeah, you the can code. modify, I'm sorry, say what? I was just gonna say the code for this is similar to whack-a-mole as well. 
And with this, they, the code that they can modify is, do they want two splats, three splats, or four splats? You can see you got two in the top, three in the middle, four on the bottom. And then you can also modify the time based on the distance of the splats. So if the splats are closer, you give the student less amount of time to do it. If you're in a position where you need your splats further apart, then you give them more seconds to be able to get out and get back before it's over. Um, so we were able to modify the code on how many splats and then how much time we needed to complete the task. So it was just modifying the code just a little bit more. We're slowly getting into it step by step by step. Awesome. This one's a fun one. I know we're running a little bit short on time here, but uh, we've got two more activities to show you. This one was a uh, full group capture the flag and uh, we turned it into capture the splat. And as Lauren was saying, you can, the challenge for our students was to turn any game into the code. What does it take for each one of these games to, for the code and how you would create it? And so we talked about it with this class and we went step by step, right? How do we take our capture the flag that we play um, after all of our standard and learning tests are completed from May to June, we go outside and we play this capture the flag. How do we take that game and code it step by step and what we need for capture the splat? And we're able to create, it was fun. We are able to create it right there. And I think the code, if you get that QR code, the, the code is screenshot in that for you. All right, because we are short on time. I want to get to this next one because we talked about earlier at our school, kindergarten through fifth grade all does coding. Well, the dry erase boards on the side is what we use with kindergarten first grade for the coding. In their groups of three, they would take a game that they wanted to create and they would start writing down what they want their game to do. And so we have kindergarten first graders, no, they don't have the app in their hand. They're not actually coding, but it's, it's the beginning. It's the, the, the learning phases as step one, step two, step three, cause and effect. You do this, this happens. You do this, this happens. And so they on the dry erase board started writing down what game they're playing and how they want the game to work out if they were to code it and everything. So it was phenomenal what they're able to come up with. Yeah. And then on the left side there, you see the boys in a little group there, our third, fourth, fifth graders. Um, I guess kindergarten, first, second grade did the writing one, third, fourth, fifth grade did the actual coding. So they're in groups with the iPad and they're actually doing their own codes um, on a game they're creating. Awesome. Right, and I, I love this because our education director, Emily, always says the rules for the game are the rules for the code. And so the first step to coding is to write out the rules. So I think this is a, a, a perfect activity for it to show students who are just you know, in, intro, being introduced to, to block coding for the first time. All right, so just wrapping up here, I wanted to show one quick activity that was great for mixing STEM and also physical activity that was also virtual. So this is a screenshot of a tweet from um, one of our PE teachers, Kevin Terry. You might be connected with him on Twitter, Eric, but mm -hmm. he did our fall fitness challenge. And how it worked is that the students got to build their own stopwatches and countdown timers. And now I know this looks like a lot of code, but it was all done in little sections. And so each sort of day that they were working on it, they were building a new piece of their code until at the end, they got to do a fitness machine where, you know, how many jumping jacks can you do in 30 seconds and then time yourself and then do it again. And how many, how many pushups can you do in 50 seconds? Um, and so it's just a really fun way for PE teachers to uh, to connect with our students online and do some coding virtually, even though um, yeah, it can be, as Eric said, it's a challenge. So uh, this was just one example of a, of a program that we ran over the fall um, specifically to make STEM and PE. And the beauty of that right there, Lauren, that doesn't have to be just PE teachers. That could be classroom teachers also quite easily. Absolutely. Yep. We had, we had a few um, tech teachers all across the board participate, but, um, but the the classes who got the most stomps i'll say were the pe teachers <laughs> <laughs> we are competitive <laughs> yes <laughs> awesome so i think the one thing that eric and i talked about was just sort of the message of you know getting people collaborating not just your students but also the teachers in the school so you know talking to your pe teacher and seeing you know how can you collaborate with them and how can they bring 
stem into their classes and how can you bring some movement into yours and so really just this message of um, collaboration as a as a school and as a team anything to add eric collaborating um, doesn't matter if it's classroom teacher or art music pe it's important for all of us to communicate with each other it's for the best of the student that everybody knows is on board with what's going on within the school so yeah, communicate with everyone, get on the same page. Let's all work together. We can accomplish so much more when we all work together. Yeah. And I'll be sharing the, the uh, link for this deck, but here's some resources that Eric um, mentioned during the slideshow. So you'll have access to all of these. Uh, and because this is a, a pre-recorded uh, webinar, we will be live with you on the chat. So if you have any questions, now's the time, write us in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Um, my email is my name, just lauren at unruly-studios.com. Uh, Eric, you can find Eric on Twitter, Round Hill PE, uh, and he, he also has a, a website and YouTube channel, so definitely check those out as well. And uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing from you all and hearing how maybe you are already combining uh, movement and STEM, but hopefully we gave you some ideas and Eric gave him a lot of amazing resources that you can try out and see if it works with, with your students and reach out to me, let's collaborate. Let's get something together where um, our school and your school works together. And we, uh, you know, we can compete against each other. We can learn from each other. We can just challenge each other. Um, it's, it's nice when, when you can do a collaboration with another school. My community is different than your community. Your community is different than my community. And it's great for my students to learn from your students. And it's great for your students to learn from my students. So let's get together. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. I really appreciate it. You give some amazing resources here and it's always, always refreshing to hear what you're up to and what you're doing. So keep on, keep on doing what you're doing. It's great. Thank you, Lauren. It was great being with you today. I loved it. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you on the chat. I'm going to stop the recording.